career journals and has guided five students. The CV Raman Young Scientist Award in Physical Sciences for the year 2020, uh, 2003. The Best Woman Scientist Award for the year 2012 from the Astronautical Society of India. Distinguished Alumni Award from the Old Students Association of Hindu College, Delhi 2017. Uh, apart from this, she was also a member of the Team of Excellence Award of ISRO for AstroSat Mission 2015. And the ASI Zubin Kembhabi Award was conferred on the Team AstroSat for the year 2021, and she was also a member of that team. A brief summary of her educational background. She completed her schooling from Kendriya Vidyalaya Andrews Ganj, Delhi, BSc Physics Honors from Hindu College, Delhi University, MSc Physics from IIT Madras, and finally completed her PhD in Physics from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. So we are uh, very privileged to have you, ma'am, today with us for this lecture. Please welcome to the lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Arunima. Sita, you may now begin. Thank you so much, Arunima and Dibendu, for the kind words. And uh, to the Astronomical Society at large for giving me this opportunity uh, to speak in this series called Women in Astronomy. And that too, as a first speaker, I'm just honored to be the first speaker. And it's very, very appropriate that we are having this talk today uh, on the UN International Day for Women and Girls in Science. And I hope um, I would be able to share some of my journey and uh, through ISRO, which would be of help to other women and girls in science field. So let's uh, start the talk per se. I will be switching off the video right now just to save bandwidth. I'm, I'm joining in from home today, um, but I'll come back after the talk back on the video. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so... Um, here goes. Um, I, I wish to thank uh, the person from the POEC who is going to share the slides for me now. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Okay. The space science in India actually had its early beginnings using balloons and sounding rockets. You might have read about this. Uh, and so uh, these were the first ones in the early 1960s, as early as 1960s, we had the sounding rockets and earlier than that, the balloons. Um, and primarily TAFR, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and the Physical Research Laboratory at Ahmedabad, along with the space wing of the then... Uh, uh, that time it was not designated as ISRO, but the, they together actually went through these experiments on balloons and sounding rockets. Um, of course, the same teams, that is TFR and PRL and ISRO, joined together for the experiments on the first Indian satellites, Aryabhata and Bhaskara. And um, I joined... After Bhaskara 2, I joined the ISRO Satellite Center in Bangalore in the Technical Physics Division on 28 February 1980. Um, and uh, Technical Physics Division at that time was considered as a central place where uh, Earlier to even I, my joining, people used to join there and then decide how they should grow in ISRO and which division or group they should be participating in within ISRO, within especially the ISRO Satellite Center. 
so uh, it had several members not only the people belonging to technical physics division it also had members who would come in and then choose to go out of the division to other divisions like sensors division and so on so in fact i had one one friend who was the russian translator for isro who also was a member of this division she used to sit there she had a table there and that's how we why do i make this point is uh, we in this division had the chance to meet and interact with several members of isro at that time and made friends and they when they went out to the different divisions we could then interact with the members of those divisions so that was a great thing for us to do especially in the 1980s when the overall uh, unit itself was only few hundreds in numbers my first activity in technical physics was really technical many people used to ask me mean the technical physics this is why it was named technical physics because it had physics it had uh, engineering it had everything and a little bit of management and so on um so my first thing was actually in applied physics my re first report was on acoustic emission for non destructive testing of um subsystems which would be used in satellites or rockets um so this was purely uh, uh applied physics but i wanted to work on the physics characterization of this acoustic mission uh, but then uh, the main um, unit and the main instrument which came that was uh, um, given to the structures division so i could have shifted to structures division at that time and uh, gone on to um, actually applying the techniques for the satellites however i decided to stay back in uh, technical physics simply because probably i liked physics more so that's why early on i had this uh, uh chance to make a very important decision um and then i went on to work in a soft x ray rocket experiment so i had the opportunity to also work on a rocket experiment just because one of my colleagues who was working on it actually had to leave and so i worked on the later phases of the test and evaluation and the environmental tests and the launch of it um while we were doing this along with that institute of fundamental research we also worked on a proposal jointly for an x-ray experiment to be flown on indian satellite and we will i will come to that later so um and that was a time when isro was launching on to uh, the remote sensing and the communication payload starting with the bhaskara which was the series for remote sensing and also apple which was the first satellite for communication satellite after that we started the series called the IA, indian remote sensing satellites irs and the uh, uh, insat and later on the geosat gsat series for communication so the science had to take a, a wait for the indian satellites to be launched on indian launch vehicles which were yet to come in the early 80s so next slide uh, so while we were waiting for this uh, we started in the technical physics division we knew we had to go for astronomy pay experiments on the indian satellite so we started doing astronomy in the optical band using ground based observatories so the first observatory we used was that the kavalur which was the closest to us and which had excellent skies at that time 1980s uh, it was amazing to see the skies at kavalur uh, and i started observing from kavalur in 1982 i think february was my first visit um those days uh, observing used to be from the observing floor 
directly at the telescope dome. So uh, we used to do these night shifts and um, we used to mount the instrument behind the telescope and we had to view directly through the IP center, the star, etc., etc. And then we had an electronic system. So the photometer itself, as shown in the blue block, had optics for viewing, centering, etc. Mm -hmm. And the detector, which was a photomultiplier tube, cooled photomultiplier tubes. And the output from the photomultiplier tubes used to go to the nimbins after pre-amplification, used to go to nimbins, which were sitting on the table through a long cable, uh, which had photon counters. And we had a parallel printer. And the dark printer used to make dark, dark, dark sound every time it made a print of the time and the counts which are coming from the star. So we did photometry, which means we measure the intensity of the particular star which we measure in terms of light curve. So every time the input would come. So this was, um, uh, we would set the integration time of few seconds, maybe two seconds or five seconds. So every time the counts from the star came uh, every two seconds, the printer would make a tack sound. And uh, so when the outside members used to hear this sound, they knew the ISRO team was at uh, Kavalur. And uh, because this was very bulky, the instrument and also the nimbins and the printer and so on, I, I, along with a colleague of mine, started working also on an 8085-based photon counter to make it less bulky to carry. Because we used to carry these photometers in the train in a wooden box, uh, which we used to actually show to the railways uh, members to say that this is a scientific instrument. Then we used to get down at the railway station, then take a jeep and go all the way to the observatory, then unpack and so on. So it was it was a really laborious ta task to even travel to Kavalur, which used to take half a day uh, at that time. Um, so clearly, because I had the experience of taking electronics in my MSc in IIT Madras, so I started working on the 8085-based photon counter along with a colleague who also wanted to do some R&D kind of work using this micro processor. It's another thing that we both finally got married based on this activity, which uh, we did. And so Venkatesh is my husband now, uh, based on this. Next slide. Later on, at that time, we were using one channel photometer. We used to measure only the variability of a particular star in one channel. That is the main star. Why do we measure photometry? Is because stars are variable. It might be the variability might be due to either geometric because it rotates, it revolves around another star, etc. And so we used to choose, for example, X-ray binaries so that in future we could study them with the X-ray proposal whenever it comes on the satellite. And we could then study in optical, the optical counterpart of that binary. So these variabilities used to be of the order of few seconds. And uh, that was what we studied. But remember that if there are very, very, very faint clouds, I told you Kavalur skies were very good those days. But if there were faint clouds, then which even the eye couldn't see, then we would see variabilities which were not genuinely from the star. So we decided, myself and a colleague of mine, Mr. Ashoka, 
and uh, Dr. Marar, who was heading our team at that time, that we needed two or three channel photometer where we could measure the main star and also a comparison star in the field so that if we see variabilities and we don't see those variabilities in the comparison star or the third channel, which was a sky channel, then we would know definitely that we would know and we could prove that it was definitely from the main star. So you can see on the right bottom panel, a, a light curve. Again, these are consisting of individual points as integration for a particular time, but the whole light curve is for several hours. So it looks like a continuous line. So you can see the top curve, which shows variabilities that is from the main star. The second curve is from the compar comparison star and it does not show variabilities, but it does show the overall sky variation and the bottom curve, which shows the actual sky variation. So we could actually correct for the sky variation by either dividing, first subtracting the sky channel and also by dividing by the comparison star. So we were very happy that the IAU uh, General Assembly meeting took place at New Delhi in 1985. We met some of the members who were involved in such uh, two channel, three channel photometers developing these and uh, they were also involved in photometry. Um, and so it was a great opportunity to meet some of our collaborators with whom we started working later in the whole Earth telescope. With this light two, three, two and three channel photometer, we also started going to other telescopes within India um, at Nainital, now it is called Aries Observatory and at Mount Abu, which is, uh, which is uh, operated by the Physical Research Laboratory. So the top uh, view is of the top picture is of the Aries Observatory and the next picture is of the Mount Abu Observatory. So students who are on the stock, please go to these websites, see what facilities they have for making observations with Indian telescopes. Um, and uh, also, of course, the Himalayan Chandra Telescope which is uh, there at Handle or near Leh in Ladakh. Um, so based on this uh, facility and the capability for us to monitor this uh, variability uh, in photometry, we got a chance to be a part of an international collaboration called the Whole Earth Telescope, which was using this several observatories to actually monitor a particular star right through the day and for several days. Why do I say this? Because from a particular observatory, we can observe stars only during night time. And when the sun rises, we have to stop our observations. So under the whole Earth telescope, we used to hand over handover, meaning virtually, the observations to the next observatory, which is there, which is uh, eastward, uh, no, sorry, which is, uh, uh, which could then see the night after us, um, westward, and which could carry on the observation. So we could get, for example, under the whole Earth telescope, we could get observations continuously for 24 hours for a few days. And this was essential for studying white dwarf pulsations and doing asteroseismology uh, of white dwarfs, which was a new upcoming field. And it, uh, a part of it, part of the data of asteroseismology, I used for my PhD thesis. Um, so this is to say, that uh, look out for options. Uh, we plan for something, but that may not happen within the time scale, within the place where you stay, et cetera, et cetera. But whichever opportunity you get, 
please take that and you might do something very good you might you might learn something a lot different which might come in useful a, a lot later all the all the things about stars in the sky their locations etc i learned doing optical photometry on the telescope floor next slide uh so having done this uh, optical photometry using ground based telescopes why one may ask why do we need to go to space and all that i can say is the earth's atmosphere does not allow a uh, certain wavelengths in the electromagnetic spectrum especially the ultraviolet and x rays as is shown in the pink region mm -hmm. um, in the adjoining figure um, those are all obscured by the earth's atmosphere and even in the infrared and the gamma rays to a certain extent it's obscured so while we can use balloon facility for doing studies in infrared and high energy x rays and gamma rays for ultraviolet and x rays we need to go to either rockets or satellites so that's the justification and we use this justification for our future satellites next slide so i said we were waiting for these indian satellites on indian launch vehicles and uh, this is uh, something we did and uh, that uh, proposal before we had the mass for the proposal of that x ray satellite we actually uh, did a previous uh, experiment called the gamma ray burst experiment on a sros satellite before that the sros satellite could carry much less mass only up to 5 kg with the power requirement of 1 watt and uh, we uh, that time and even now the study of gamma ray burst is was a very topical scientifically relevant topic and uh, we made a payload for this and i should say that me several people helped us in actually configuring when i say help they might have just given us advices but it was extremely important because we were a young team we had to evolve our own processes we had to evolve our own uh, uh, what do you call uh, schedules we had to evolve our own test uh, process test evaluation procedures and so on so sometimes i think we were like ants you know i mean and that's why the bottom picture we were like ants going through uh, various paths to reach our final goal of making the payload um uh, the unfortunately for us the first two launches of aslv failed and that's the reason uh, why my phd thesis was using still optical data otherwise i would have used to the gamma ray burst data finally of course the saw c and the saw c2 um, worked very well and we got to see the first results next slide uh, next and the first results coming from the saw c2 on a on genuine gamma ray burst and um, Over fifty gamma ray bursts were recorded from the Saros C two satellite, and we we could contribute to the interplanetary network for localization by triangulation of these gamma ray bursts because these bursts can happen any time, anywhere in the sky, and so and so when there are low Earth satellites which did not have localization capability, we needed many satellites. to do triangulation like the same technique which is being used for gps now to actually triangulate to see objects on the earth we used the same techniques to actually localize the source of gamma ray burst in the sky so that was our first uh, success in a space experiment and we were very happy to do that um then of course uh the indian x-ray astronomy experiment which we proposed with tfr uh we got the opportunity to fly it uh, next slide on a 
remote sensing satellite called IRSP3. Um, and uh, this IRS satellite could handle a few hundred kg of payload. Uh, since it was a remote sensing satellite, uh, it carried the main payload was a remote sensing payload. And we were riding piggyback. Uh, and our payload was to the tune of 50 kg. And we could uh, accommodate this on the remote sensing satellite. Uh, we could study in detail uh, tw about 20 sources, several PhDs came out of this. Uh, and this satellite actually provided the capability for Indian satellites, Indian satellites, for the first time to point to and observe in individual sources using star sensors on this Indian satellite. So that was a major capability which we gained technically using this. And um, that is what actually laid the foundation for proposing for the future astronomy mission. So, and of course there was a solar X-ray experiment also on geostationary platform, GSAT-2. Next slide. Uh, and then the, so I said we proposed for the uh, dedicated astronomy mission. And on that, we, uh, our team started working on the scanning sky monitor because, because of our interest in variable stars and X-ray transients. So we started working and I was the PI for this uh, scanning sky monitor, uh, which was to measure any variability in the uh, in known X-ray sources and also to detect any new transients, X-ray transients in the sky. So it was for us a new instrument and we had to configure everything. And because it was a rotating platform, it was mounted on a rotating platform. So we also had to actually interact with several satellite uh, committee teams on how to take the signal from the rotating platform, how to rotate it without um, any uh, hassles. And um, so it was uh, a, a totally new experience for me and my team. So as you all know, next slide, uh, while we were working on this, ISRO itself started off on space science missions. So we were in the era of spy missions compared to what we had done earlier, the just the piggyback experiments. So we had the Chandrayaan one mission, one mission, which was the first lunar mission for us, which, which to which it, the detection of water on moon is attributed to. Then we had the Mars orbiter mission, um, uh, which went for the first time outside the gravity of the Earth totally. And of course, the AstroSat mission. And now we have also the Chandrayaan-2 mission. AstroSat and Chandrayaan-2 are still performing. And uh, AstroSat has completed over seven years. Chandrayaan-2 also has completed four years. The orbiter itself, of course, the lander and the rover we could not accomplish. So we have used, uh, for example, several launch vehicles, PSLV, GSLV, and GSLV Mark III. And of course, we are going to use the SSLV also for a science mission, which was launched yesterday successfully. Next slide. So while we were doing all this, uh, my journey uh, in late 2012, uh, I took on the role of uh, program director at the uh, ISRO headquarters. And um, this was a new role, totally management role. Uh, so I left behind all the hardware development, all the experiment which I, which I love to do. And I gave it to the next uh, team, uh, handed over the whole responsibility to the team, which then accomplished the delivery of the payload itself. Um, uh, 
I also because at I was at the headquarters, I was a review member of the Mars Orbiter mission payloads, and also after the launch, arranged for the review of the science results, etc., coming from them. Um, for the first time there, I made the announcement for um, data release from Chandrayaan One and Mars Orbiter mission data with the payload scientists so that the data could be made open for researchers outside the payload teams. And so now many, many members from universities, etc., have utilized the data from both Chandrayaan and WOM, and that has resulted in over 200 publications from Chandrayaan and several dozens of publications from WOM. Um, and I also did put up for proposed approvals, Chandrayaan 2 uh, and the X-ray polarization satellite Exposat and Aditya L1, which were approved um, from the ISRO headquarters and uh, the um, government of India. Next slide. So after this, my major responsibility was the overall responsibility of AstroSat. So I was the PI from 2011 for AstroSat. And uh, in the first PI was Professor P.C. Agarwal of TAFR. I took over from him when he retired. And um, this was a full-fledged dedicated astronomy mission. And uh, it had five payloads. It has a collaboration of, of ISRO, several units of ISRO, and several science institutes, university, and also Canadian Space Agency and the University of Leicester uh, to develop the whole payloads and the satellite. So it has five main payloads and a charge particle monitor. So for us, it was again a totally new experience to have a dedicated mission. And uh, next slide. So this is the picture of that satellite before launch. And you have these five payloads. Uh, and this was the first satellite, Indian satellite, where the mass of the experiments was more than 50% of the mass of the overall satellite. So we really nicely optimized this satellite for taking large mass science payloads. So uh, it is launched into a near Earth 650 kilometer orbit with a low, low inclination, equatorial inclination, near equatorial six degree inclination. And it has, as I said, completed 7.5 years in orbit. And for the first time, PSLV launched it into a low Earth orbit. So while we were doing all these science things, things were also being developed in the satellite capability as I said, rotating platform, thermal requirements, and so on, and also the launch capabilities. Next slide. So in the payloads itself, we had several technical achievements. We, uh, for the first time, the far and near UV optics was developed in, within ISRO. The, um, there was... Um, Overall, the overall resolution of this uh, UV optics and the telescope and the detector together is better than 1.5 arc second with a large field of view of 28 arc minutes. And there was also a major facility set up to actually integrate this UV optics called the MGK Menon uh, facility in the Indian Institute of Astrophysics which could uh, integrate and test and calibrate this UV imaging telescope. Then we had the indigenous X-ray optics developed at TIFR and the high pressure gas filled counters developed at TIFR. And of course, we also used the commercially available cadmium zinc telluride with detectors which are used for medical imaging. We proved that we made them space worthy and they, we flew them as one of the high energy X-ray payloads. 
Yeah, so the, there are a lot of achievements technically on this satellite, apart from, of course, several spin-offs. Uh, scientific achievements itself, we have several. We have done uh, detection of alignment continuum. I won't go into the details because many of you may not be per se astronomy followers right now. You might be in general science. But just to say that we could achieve most of almost all of the uh, aims which we went to with which which we proposed as to sat i think we have completed and we have achieved much more than what we what we proposed for and one of the things which you see on the bottom panel which i contributed to personally is that in making this the first space observatory for India by making open opportunity to observe using AstroSat to all researchers the world over. So we have, we initially started it with Indian observers and now all observers right through the world can apply for time on AstroSat and they can use AstroSat to observe a particular target of their interest and the mission and the um, tracking station operations team make sure that these observations are done and the data are disseminated. Next slide, please. So when we make this opportunity, um, next slide. Yeah, when we make this announcement for people to propose, we have to uh, take care of several other things. We have to take care of several tools, several processes, several procedures in place. And so this uh, flowchart sort of gives you all that we uh, developed specifically for this uh, satellite called AstroSat. So there has to be a uh, provision for people to make proposals. There have to be tools for them to calculate how long they need to observe. There, have to, there has to be a review committees to actually review the incoming proposals and select what should be done and then give it back to ISRO and say that these are the ones which are scientifically viable. And then the ISRO teams, operating teams, take care of the operations. And again, the ISRO teams, the Indian Space Science Data Center will receive the data and then get the process data from the payload operation center and actually disseminate them again from ISSTC. So this has also led to the growth of several other such procedures, policies, teams, and so on for this kind of satellite. And we are going to use this for our future astronomy missions. Next, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the upcoming missions are the X-ray polarization satellite. This is a collaboration with Raman Research Institute and ISRO um, to study X-ray polarization and spectra of X-ray sources. And as I said, this is probably going to be launched on one of the future uh, SSLV, which was uh, successfully launched yesterday. Um, and then, of course, we have the Aditya L1, which is to study the processes, which is the first dedicated mission from India for studying the sun, though we had a piggyback payload to study the sun earlier on GSAT 2. This will be a dedicated mission. again. We have seven payloads and uh, we have several uh, institutes and universities coming in to contribute to the payloads, contribute to um, uh, the tests, etc., on these experiments and in future also to the science coming out from these experiments. So next slide, I will spend a few minutes on this slide. All this was, though I interspersed it with a lot of my journey, uh, I thought I'd share a, a, some learning experience which I had with this slide. Uh, 
um, apart from my scientific uh, and technical uh, endeavors, um, I'm happy to say I also contributed to few things. Um, ISRO is not an academic institution. So I had to convince them that uh, junior research fellows and visiting scientists are extremely important for undertaking such science missions. And uh, therefore, I, when I was there at the head there, I sort of worked out the procedures of how to take in JRFs and visiting scientists within the ISRO Satellite Center. And now that has been uh, utilized by the several centers in ISRO. And I'm very happy to say that this is working very well. Many younger people are able to come and work with us in ISRO. I was also the chairman of the CRISH committee at the URO Satellite Center. Uh, we had proposed for a crash in the uh, early 80s uh, because we felt the number of uh, women employees were growing and they would be, and you know that the uh, space work with satellites has no time limit. So many, many of us had to stay beyond office work, office hours and so on. So we had proposed that uh, it would be extremely useful for the women employees to know that who don't have uh, appropriate support at home, to know that their children are being taken care at, some, at a facility and they don't have to worry about them. And so finally, in the 90s, uh, with the help of... Uh, the controller with the help of the director there at URSC, we could set up. And of course, the head of the medical unit, Dr. Chitra then, and we could set up this crush. And I'm extremely happy that the younger people are very happy with this crush. And uh, uh, it's continuing very well. I was also instrumental in uh, actually making our libraries uh, digital, uh, because uh, while the astronomy libraries in the various institutes went digital early on uh, to convince uh, ISRO and Department of Space that we need to go digital, I was, I along with my colleague in LEOS was instrumental in doing this and implementing, getting it implemented within the Department of Space. So now all the libraries within ISRO and DOS are connected. I was also in, involved in several social activities. Uh, we had a union, we had a team called Varsha, and that was close to my heart. And that's something I continue now after retirement. Uh, so a, a few or five more minutes. This is what I learned during my journey. The first thing is, this is not a philosophical statement. It is that you should know yourself what you like to do and what you're good at. These two may be same. Sometimes we find that it is not the same. We like to do something, but we are taught, we're good at something else also. So it's good during your journey as a student, as a career person to know this simply because that helps you make decisions and it makes you make the right decisions. And in knowing yourself, I think, apart from science, the human, the subjects of humanities or art subjects help you very well, especially literature, arts, painting, music, etc., help you very well, simply because, for example, in literature, you might read stories about various, uh, it might even be a, it might be fiction stories, but then you can relate yourself to some uh, characters which are similar to you and that helps you to understand yourself. Yeah, that's one thing. Second, role definition and role change. Many places, your role may not be defined. And so sometimes you have to define the role for yourself. And when you when your role changes, sometimes you have to go from I did this 
to we did this and later sometimes they did this for us so please be aware of this and change yourself when you change the role and there will be situations which bother you if it is if it is too severe that it affects your daily life if it affects your self respect you have to take it up but if it is not so severe if it is just a part of grape pine etc my own experience has been if we keep the head, if we keep our heads above water that's sufficient for us to sail through because certain things have a way of uh, starting and ending on their own some situations uh, but as i said if it is severe one has to take action appropriate action with the help of others then conflict resolution is important because conflict uh, whether it's with, within you or within it is with you and some some people or some programs outside you it can keep you bothered and so um, resolve it especially within you because if it is something you can't do something with anything about it resolve it within yourself that you can't do anything about it just get on with this uh, leave that behind and get on with other things so that's extremely important because then you clear your ram space in your head and that's important for doing whatever you have to do make friends friends are easy when you are children when you are students in student life it's easy to make friends but it's extremely dif difficult when you are in a career because there's competition there's no time to make friends you can't time you don't have time to discuss with them and so on and there are differences and so on so but do take time if you form friendships nothing like it in career uh, apart from friends have mentors who can and they, these can be outside supervisors or guides because you might need some guidance on what to do so if possible also have mentors all said and done many of us who who go through science careers have a good working atmosphere and we do have mentors earlier i think mentors used to be you know within families itself for example in a joint family we would already always relate to an uncle an aunt or a uh, Uh, also to a nephew or a cousin or somebody but uh, now we need mentors in the careers um why do i say next be aware of the outside world we have a very good working atmosphere by and large when we work in science of course there might be some problems in some colleges some problems in uni universities where it is not as good as we would like it to be however remember we also work with a lot of people who contribute to our success people who are working on contract basis people who are uh, working um in um temporary basis and they also contribute to us and so be sensitive to them just like we wanted many people to be sensitive to our work when we were growing we in turn should be sensitive to what they are uh, they contribute finally you will get both roses and brick bats and many times it will be brick brick bats and not roses uh, but it's a journey and so go through this journey and all the time be kind to yourself because ultimately it's you who are doing it and keep smiling and thank you for giving me this opportunity to give you this talk thank you all i hand it over to the organizers again thank you sita uh, for your for your lovely talk um 
So we'll take some questions now before we go to the formal ending, if there are some questions. Um, so uh, people in Zoom, you can type in your question in the caption, uh, in the chat box here. Uh, people in YouTube, you can type in your questions to, uh, you can post your questions uh, to the YouTube link. And uh, we will uh, collate that and put in here. I mean, I understand it's not a technical talk, so there may not be the usual questions, but any other questions are welcome. And while you're waiting, uh, I'd just like to highlight a comment. Uh, Sita, maybe you already know, uh, somebody called Radhika, Radhika writes in YouTube, uh, honored to be your student, always proud to be a student. You have been a good guide to me, even during your busy schedule at headquarters. Yeah, thank you so much, Devendu. Yeah, I did. I, I really enjoyed my teaching in uh, JAP, especially the instrumentation part. Sita, you got muted. Yeah. This this was Sita a comment from Radhika in YouTube. Yeah, thanks. Sita, I think you got muted again. Maybe you're trying to put your video on. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Radhika. Thanks so much, Radhika. And I hope I was a good guide to all of you students. Uh, there, might, there will be moments when I would have been very, very tense and very critical. But it, that's essential. That's why I said you need mentors outside of your supervisors and guides. Yeah, I hope my own students are listening in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is yeah. what I tell them. You need to know more people beyond beyond you know, beyond your immediate neighborhood. This is very, very yes. important for dissipating your frustrations with your supervisor sometimes. Yes, yes. So I have a question while people are probably thinking. So, I mean, you know, as you were saying that, you know, beyond doing all of this at his, his to headquarters, doing your own science, managing missions, dealing with people from all over the country, which you have done uh, when you were... Um, PI for AstroSat and coordinating the mission. You also managed to teach before that and you should take JAP courses, the Joint Astronomy uh, Physics uh, Program. Uh, and I remember, I don't know whether you remember, we did take some courses that you offered, right? How did you manage so many things at the yes. same time? Did you ever feel like burning out? Because this is often a feeling that many of us get, right? When you are doing so many things and you just think that, okay, you only just give up and, and go. How would you manage that? Do you ever feel like that? Yeah, that is, uh, uh, in the early years, our uh, schedule used to be not so hectic. And so it was, it was fairly easy, I should say. But later years, yes, when, 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 for example, Astros had started, family is demanding a lot of your time and uh, Teaching, yes. In fact, my last JAP class, maybe I felt that was just before uh, launch of AstroSat. I, I still feel maybe I shouldn't have taken it. I was so tense during that JAP uh, class. Uh, but I enjoyed teaching. The reason is uh, uh, instrumentation was something close to our, my heart. And uh, I wanted people to actually get into instrumentation. I think that was what made me uh, get people interested in instrumentation in astronomy. Yeah. So, yes, there will be moments. There will be moments when you feel like giving up. But you, won't, you don't want to give up. Simply because... Uh, somebody has to hold on, right? I mean, if everybody gives up, there is there is not going to be a mentor for the younger students. <laughs> so, so sometimes you have to, as I said, you have to grin and bear it. <laughs> yeah, I like that philosophy. I don't know how you did it for so many years and you're still doing it. Grin and bear it, yes. I have, I have had tense moments. Yes. <laughs> Now, for those who don't know, I mean, Sita is also a wonderful mentor, not just to students, but to even people like many of us who are 
we're not students anymore. I mean, it's like we have few decades between the student days and us. And sometimes when you get frustrated, we, you know, when we talk to Sita, and she is very good at at philosophizing and dissipating things. And many of you have seen her in action uh, in various places, more recently during the National Space Science Exhibition, right? Uh, so she, she plays a very important mentoring role for even faculty and scientists who are at mid to, you know, and young to mid career level as well and beyond. So thank yeah. you, Sita, for that. I have two more comments coming in from Nand Kumar Choudhury. This is a nice yeah. talk, madam. I was yeah. also fortunate to work with you for some time. Thank you, Nandu. And I, I know that you are doing very, very well. Um, yeah, I had a short interaction with him. And uh, he was, he joined as a, a JRF in ISRO. But later on, he got a job at Raipur University and he had to go back. But I'm extremely happy that the quiet Nandu is doing so many things now. <laughs> Dharam remarks that Sita taught me astronomical instrumentation and he's, he's, he's saying that it's great to hear from you again. Girish writes that I'm the first student of Dr. Sita and I'm very yeah. fortunate for that. She was not only a good, men she was not only a good mentor for me, uh, but one of the best human beings and humble person. I completely second that. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, yeah, ahead, Doje. Ahead, it was great meeting you, Doje. It was just great meeting you during the NSSS exhibition. Because I've gone, I've seen so many of your excellent photographs. I now have one on my table. Yeah, there is uh, um, then I learned during my AstroSat days, I learned that there is a lot of conflict between teams, some real, many perceived. And one has to see the perception of both sides to even think of resolving them, leave alone finally resolving them, even think of resolving them unless we are able to see how they perceive the problem. That's very difficult, yeah. Um, okay, this is a... Well, this is more of, a, I don't know whether you were in a position to answer this. This is from somebody called Rahul Pandit in YouTube who asked, ma'am, what is the present update about Astronautics Training Center? Okay, I won't be able to give the exact uh, thing, but I know that there is a center coming up near the uh, airport at Bangalore uh, and uh, it's getting completed. And so that's where Though the, uh, though, though the astronauts uh, have got training outside abroad, but there's also going to be a center developed here near uh, airport in Bangalore. Near airport is just, uh, uh, just to give you a sort of rough location. It's not, it has nothing to do with the airport itself. If Girish has some updates on that, he can... Put it on the chat. Okay. Um, so Piyang, uh, Piyang, I guess this is Piyang Jaiswal, is asking, um, what do you do when, when things feel too difficult to handle? Sort of the water goes out of your head. It's kind of an idiom. Um, I mean, when things get too overwhelming. I mean, how, you know, I, mean, I guess what, what he's asking is how to relieve that stress, how to relax. Yeah, when things get uh, tough, I know it is difficult to re even relax. You know you want to relax, but it's very difficult. So that's where I said, know yourself, one, because it's good to analyze the issue. Um, is this really worth uh, worrying so much about it? Because different people want different things out of it. What What is it in it for you? Or is it uh, worth worrying? One. Second is, as I said, that um, hobbies. This is where the keeping track of some of your hobbies really helps. Just take time off at that time just to go and do something 
maybe you you are interested in sports you are interested in painting you are interested in music go for a concert go for the various things or what i find very very uh, useful is that i like to walk the talk i like i would have loved to talk with somebody uh, who could give me some know how to solve this issue either solve it or even think about it differently sometimes we when we think about a problem ourselves we think about it in a particular way and our mind goes in the same way but when we talk to it to somebody else they can give a different perspective on this so that helps a lot i hope i know it is difficult i know it is difficult but it's not and we the first thinking which we have to get out is that i am the only one facing this no everyone has gone through it each one has um come out of it in different ways so maybe sharing experiences might help that's where you need mentors and friends of course <laughs> thank you sita i think uh, we will close there um thank you again on behalf of the public outreach and education committee and uh, the working group on gender equity orunima had just informed some time back that she needs to rush out um before we close i would like to invite uh, professor dipankar banerjee uh, director edis also the current president of the astronomical society of india to make some closing remarks on behalf of the si dipankar the stage is yours thank you thank you very much uh, dibindu and uh, thanks uh, sita for you know taking us along with your uh, journey it's very inspirational and i hope uh, you know on this uh, auspicious day i would put it uh, to you know uh, energize our our younger uh, women and you know girls uh, colleague uh, for coming to space sciences uh, you know this is a, a apt moment i would say uh, i would like to just say a few words uh, in, on behalf of the astronomical society of india is dedicated uh, to educating the indian public about astronomy astrophysics and space science and to diversify human resources in our field asi was uh, one of the first pan india organization to have a public outreach committee and also a working group on gender equity who are seriously engaged in outreach amongst the public and students and as is the diversity of our workforce highlight challenging issues and make recommendations towards developing an equitable and inclusive work environment for all towards that end on behalf of the asi i very much welcome this new initiative to highlight inspirational women in astronomy and dr sita for delivering this first lecture in this series and everyone involved in hosting this lecture with particular mention of the poic team and gender equity team led by dr vibhendu nandi and dr arunima banerjee uh, thank you again uh, for this uh, session i hope uh, in uh, future we can host uh, such sessions also in person uh, we have our annual meeting uh, in the uh, first week of march so i would encourage uh, those who can uh, attend that uh, meeting we'll have uh, similar uh, sessions uh, uh, you know as a part of the uh, regular program or also offer uh, you know the regular program we would like to have uh, lots of uh, walk the talk as dr sita mentioned uh, and she will uh, take us uh, through that walk to another journey thank you very much for all thank you dipankar and and since you mentioned the poic and the workforce behind us uh, let me also acknowledge uh, chitradeep shaha uh, yeshita borua um, Priyanka Jaiswal, who are in the back end. Uh, I mean, we we do the thinking, but we can't do everything. So I mean, unless you have people helping and assisting, we can't really pull things like this off. So that they're somewhere Absolutely. in the back end, sitting in the other room, handling all the technicalities, the questions. So big thank you to all of you uh, for helping us host this first lecture uh, in the Women in Astronomy uh, series. And Sita, um, uh, we're supposed to give you. a memento on behalf of the astronomical society of india your talk was virtual your memento is not going to be virtual you will get a a physical real memento 
at the Astronomical Society of Me India meeting uh, at Indore. So hope to see you there and uh, hope to spend some time with you there. Thank you, Sita, and thank you, everybody, thank for signing you. in. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much to you and your team for hosting this. I've met with your team in person, and some of the mementos are there behind me, the pictures from AstroSat. So uh, I am very, very happy that I my career ended on a happy note with so many of the science missions coming through. It. And I'm looking forward to the upcoming missions too. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to ASI for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. We, we close there with the last words from Sita. Thanks.